This is part three in the series, Proving the Earth is Not Flat. The goal of this series is to show you how you can prove to yourself, with your own observations and experiments, that the Earth is a sphere. Today we will look at the Moon. It is important to understand a number of facts about the Moon so that I can show you how our observations of it can demonstrate that the Earth is a sphere, and how it can only work within the heliocentric globe model and not in any flat Earth model. The Moon is a sphere that orbits the Earth about once every 27 days. Some flat earthers will claim that the moon is a flat disk, or just a light in the sky, or some sort of projection, or even a hologram. All of these are absurd and easily refuted by the evidence. The fact that there are many different explanations, and again I use the term loosely, for the moon within the flat earth community should tell you something. There is only one explanation in the heliocentric model, the right one. But how do we know the moon is a solid sphere? Because no matter where you are on the earth, when you look at the full moon, it is always circular. Only a sphere looks round from all vantage points. If it were a flat disk, a light, or projection, circling above the flat earth, just a few thousand miles up, it would appear to look elliptical as it moves away from us. Like this, because our viewing angle would change. Also, as I pointed out in part one, it would shrink and disappear as it moved away, like this, if it were only due to perspective, as flat earthers claim. It never does this. It slides behind the horizon at the same shape and size as it was when it was overhead. Also, when you look closely at the moon with magnification, you can see that the circular craters appear increasingly elliptical as they approach the edges, and exactly in the right direction, due to the curvature of the moon's spherical surface. The moon's phases are caused by the light of the sun reflecting off the moon. As the moon revolves around the earth, we see it at different angles in relation to the sun's light. The moonlight takes on a series of shapes as it goes through its monthly cycle. You can see with a simple demonstration that any sphere lit from one side and viewed from different angles will take on these shapes. Also, it's important to remember that the sun is about 400 times farther away than the moon. So sometimes the lighted side doesn't look like it points directly to the sun, but you have to think three-dimensionally to see that it does. Some flat earthers think the phases of the moon are supposed to be caused by the earth's shadow. That is wrong. The shadow we normally see on the moon is just the moon's own shadow, the side that is shaded because it is away from the sun. This is very different from lunar eclipses, when the Earth's shadow is seen on the moon. More on that later. Some flat earthers will claim the moon gives off its own light, rather than reflecting the sun's light. This is simply impossible. What mechanism could possibly explain how a big rock gives off light, which just happens to move across the surface in a pattern corresponding to the direction of the sun. And when the moon is less than full, it is easy to see shadows in its craters and on the side of its mountains, proving that the light is external. The moon cannot be its own light source. It cannot work. It makes no sense and has no plausible mechanism. The evidence all shows that the moon is a big, reflecting, spherical rock. When we look at the moon from anywhere on Earth, we see the same face of it, with the same distinctive craters and large dark areas called mare. This is because the moon rotates at the same rate that it revolves around the Earth. It does this because the pull of the Earth's gravity caused a slight bulging of the moon, and gradually that slowed the moon down until its rotation rate relative to the Earth, reached zero. This is called tidal locking, and it is not unique to our moon. It occurs in most of the large moons in our solar system as well, and also the planet Mercury. The moon is about 239,000 miles from Earth. In most diagrams of the Earth and moon, you will see them close together like this, but this is not nearly the correct scale. 
When drawn to scale, we see that the moon is way out in the distance, about 30 times the width of the Earth away. This is why we are able to see the same face of it from everywhere on Earth. At that distance, our angle of view is essentially the same from all locations on Earth. How do we know it's that far away? Well, there are a number of ways to determine the distance to the moon. One way is by measuring the moon's angle above the horizon simultaneously from two distant points on Earth, and then using simple trigonometry to calculate the height. When this is done, the distance to the moon is calculated to around 239,000 miles, and this closely matches other modern methods of measuring the distance, including radar and lasers, and also ancient methods, such as using lunar eclipse geometry. But since the method uses the horizon, the calculation works out quite differently if you assume the Earth is flat, because you then assume the horizon is the same in both locations, while on the curved Earth, you need to compensate for the curve of the Earth between the two points. So, assuming a flat Earth puts the moon much closer, and flat Earthers calculate the moon is only about 3,000 miles away. So how can we tell who is right? Well, besides all the other evidence for the curved Earth, we know the moon cannot possibly be that close, due to the simple fact that everyone on Earth always sees the same face of the moon when it is visible in the sky. If it were only 3,000 miles away, that simply would not be possible. Let's look at an example on the flat Earth map to demonstrate this. When the moon is visible, you can see it from Maine in North America and southern Argentina in South America at the same time, since they are at the same longitude. They are each about 3,000 miles from the equator. So, if the moon is only 3,000 miles high, above the equator on the flat Earth, when viewed from the side, this forms a right triangle, with the viewing angles to the moon being 45 degrees in each location. Anyone notice the problem? This means that in each location, a person would be viewing the moon at an angle that is about 90 degrees different from the other location. They simply could not possibly both see the same features on the same side of the moon, but of course, in reality, they do. Also, if the moon is full for the northern observer, it would be only about half full for the southern observer. But we know that the moon's phases are seen almost exactly the same everywhere on the Earth at the same time. The only way you could see the same side of the moon and the same phase everywhere on Earth is if it is far out in the distance so that all viewing angles are essentially the same. You can verify this yourself. Find someone in a different part of the world and ask them what phase the moon is in. They will always see the same phase that you see, or very close to it, on the same day. This is not possible with a close moon circling above a flat Earth. Another way the moon reveals the shape of the Earth is with lunar eclipses. This is when the Earth's round shadow can be seen crossing the face of the moon. They can happen as often as once every six months and are visible everywhere on the night side of the Earth when they occur. They don't happen every month for one simple reason. The moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted about five degrees from the Earth's orbit around the sun. When shown to proper scale, with the moon about 30 Earth diameters away, you can see how the orbital tilt of five degrees can cause the moon to pass below or above Earth's shadow. This animation shows the variation of the moon's position in relation to the Earth's shadow when it reaches full moon each month. Most months, it passes above or below the shadow. Only when the angle of the moon's orbit is aligned with Earth's orbit at full moon does a lunar eclipse occur. This is a great example of how flat earthers' objections to the globe are based on a misunderstanding of the facts. They often claim an eclipse should happen every month, but this is because they do not understand the scale of the Earth-Moon system and the five-degree tilt of the Moon's orbit. They are not arguing against the actual facts. They are arguing against their own ideas of how they think it is supposed to work. This is called a straw man fallacy. When you get the facts right 
and understand all the relationships, scales, and concepts involved, you will see it really all does work. Your biggest problem is your misunderstanding of the model. My goal is to clear up as many of these misunderstandings as I can. When the orbit of the moon is aligned with the Earth at full moon, a full or partial lunar eclipse occurs, and we see the large circular shadow of the Earth pass over the moon. The Earth is about four times the size of the moon, but its shadow on the moon is a little less than that because the shadow is slightly cone-shaped. Since we know the distance to the moon, we can calculate the size of the Earth from its shadow using simple geometry, which comes out to 7,917 miles in diameter, and this matches all other measurements. As the moon is covered by the Earth's shadow, it begins to appear reddish, often called a blood moon. This occurs because of the reddish light of the Earth's atmosphere glowing on the darkened moon. It's red for the same reason sunsets are often red. Red light can pass through the atmosphere and not get scattered much, while light at the blue end of the spectrum is more easily scattered. So at sunrise and sunset, when the sunlight travels a long path through the atmosphere, the blue light has been mostly removed, leaving mostly red and yellow light remaining. The eclipsed moon is lit by a sunset that circles the globe from its perspective. This red color is further confirmation that the lunar eclipse is caused by the shadow of the Earth. I've seen some flat earthers claim that it is impossible to cast a red shadow. No, that's just wrong. The Earth doesn't really cast a red shadow on the moon, per se. It blocks the most direct white light of the sun and shines a dim red light on the darkened surface. What is the flat earth model's explanation for lunar eclipses? They really don't have one. Some of them claim it is probably due to a semi-transparent disk passing in front of the sun and shading the moon, sometimes called the anti-moon or shadow object. But they have no observations of it outside of eclipses and no explanation for what it is, why it never casts shade on the earth or blocks the stars, what holds it up, or what makes it move. It's just a special pleading fallacy with zero evidence, an attempt to save their belief from contradictory evidence. Another serious problem with the Flat Earth model is that Flat Earthers never explain what force keeps the moon circling above the Flat Earth. There is no known force that can do this. Is it magic? Is it supposed to be attached to the dome or firmament? They never really say. But of course, that could not work because it moves at a different speed and in a different path than the stars and the sun and the planets. And also, it goes in front of the sun during solar eclipses. And also, the moon's orbit, like nearly all other orbits, is not perfectly circular but slightly elliptical. So its distance from Earth varies. And we can see this because its apparent visual size varies by as much as 12%. What force in the Flat Earth model can cause that? Does it go up and down? Does it shrink and grow? In reality, we know exactly what keeps the moon moving across our sky. It's called gravity. The moon orbits the Earth due to the pull of Earth's gravity. Many of you have said that gravity has never been proven, or even that it doesn't exist. It's hard for me to describe exactly how ridiculous that is. I am still astounded when I hear a flat earther say this. You are denying something that we all easily observe every day. There is no force or phenomenon that is more scientifically proven than gravity. You don't have to understand the physics of why it works to see that it does work, and works the same everywhere in the universe. The same force that is holding you down right now and has for your entire life is the same force that causes all dropped or thrown objects to be pulled back down to the earth in a precisely predictable way and is the same force that holds the moon circling around the earth. This is how all orbits work. Smaller objects near bigger objects are pulled in by gravity. Some will crash right into the bigger object and some will be going too fast and fly on by. But if they are going the right speed, 
they will be pulled into an elliptical path around the object. But that pull is counteracted by the centrifugal force outward caused by the revolutions around the object. And because there is virtually no friction in space, objects can remain in orbit indefinitely. A very easy way to observe orbits, other than our own moon, is to look at the moons of Jupiter through a telescope. I've done this many times, and it's a very amazing sight. If you don't have a telescope, find someone who does. There are astronomy clubs all over the world that will gladly let you have a look. The four biggest moons of Jupiter orbit the planet in a short amount of time, and you can actually see their movements within a single night. Their movements are exactly predicted by the force of gravity, the same force that keeps our moon in orbit around the Earth. You really cannot honestly say gravity has never been proven. This site alone proves it, and you can see it for yourself. When I started this series, I really didn't think I would have to explain that gravity exists and how we know it exists. It is something we all experience constantly, and we can easily test it ourselves. Unless you are completely delusional, you accept that things are pulled down. So, your only problem, really, is the direction of the pull. On a giant sphere with trillions of tons of mass, the direction of pull is toward the center of mass of the sphere. You take it for granted that things are always pulled down. But down is relative. Everywhere on Earth, down is toward the center. And no, gravity is not just density and buoyancy. Density and buoyancy are factors in how gravity works. But alone, they don't explain the consistent direction of the force. It's gravity that causes the force to have a specific direction, down toward the center of the Earth. Since we are talking about gravity, I want to address another issue that keeps coming up. Flat Earthers keep asking how gravity can hold everything to the Earth, including the oceans, if it is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. Well, there is a huge misconception here. Yes, it is true that the surface of the Earth does move at about 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, but that is irrelevant and misleading. The Earth only spins once per day. That is very slow. When you say 1,000 miles per hour, you make it seem like the Earth spins very fast like a top. And some flat earthers use words like rapidly, fast, and whizzing around when describing the spin. It doesn't whiz around. It barely moves. The speed of the stars moving overhead each night is the speed of the rotation, and you won't notice them move without watching for a long time. The Earth spins once per day. That is twice as slow as the hour hand on your watch. It's only 15 degrees per hour. The only reason it is 1,000 miles per hour at the surface is because the Earth is so big. And a slow spin doesn't generate a lot of centrifugal force. Think of it this way. Hold a ball on a string and spin around fast. The ball is pulled outward by centrifugal force. Now, spin so slowly that it takes a full day to make one rotation. The ball will hang right down. Because the spin is so slow, there is almost no centrifugal force. That is the same for the Earth. The centrifugal force is so weak, it is only about 0.3% as strong as the pull of gravity. That is why we don't feel it, and why nothing, including the oceans, gets flung off into space. We can actually measure the tiny effect of centrifugal force, because objects weigh slightly less at the equator than they do at the poles. Every time you hear someone apply the Earth spins really fast at 1,000 miles per hour, think, once per day. If I can get you to understand this simple concept, you will start to see why it's perfectly reasonable that we live on a spinning ball. All your objections are based on misconceptions, misunderstandings of physics, geometry, and scale, and flat-out denial of easily observable facts. Once again, I have shown you observations we can all make that show us the Earth must be a sphere. There is no other reasonable way to explain these facts. The flat Earth model cannot explain 
while we all see the same face of the moon, and also the same phase of the moon, from every spot on Earth on the same day. And it cannot explain why we have lunar eclipses that show us the Earth's round shadow in precisely the predicted size, position, and time. Flat Earthers struggle to explain these things with outlandish, implausible, and unsupported claims. Some of these would require inventing whole new laws of physics to explain them. But there is no need for that, because the heliocentric glow model explains all of it, with easily observed and tested physical forces. Thanks for watching.